and be talking about measurement. This is concept two notes. So one thing that's important when you make measurements is that they are both accurate and precise. Accuracy is the degree to which the experimental result agrees with the accepted value. What that really means in simpler words is we just want to know how correct the measurement is. So a good measurement will be accurate. It will be correct. Precision is the degree to which measurements agree with one another. So we're looking at if you make multiple measurements over and over or you and your lab group do, you're consistently getting the same measurements. Precise can also refer to how specific the measurement is. So a measurement of 60.25 milliliters is more precise than just 60 milliliters. So we, precise measurements would be both specific but also consistent if they're made over and over. So here's kind of a visual to show the difference between um, pre precision and accuracy. So this is the bullseye and when you're throwing darts or shooting a bow and arrow the correct place to hit would be the center. So this first person is both precise and accurate. They're consistent in their um, dart throwing and they're also accurate because they're hitting the bullseye every time. This person is precise but not accurate. They're very consistent but they're not correct. They're not hitting the bullseye. This person is close to accurate. You know, they're pretty correct. They're in the center but they're not precise. They're kind of just getting all around the same spot. And then this last person is not accurate or precise. They're not correct and they're not consistent in their throws. Um, here's a more practical example with actual numbers. So let's say a student knows 85% of the material for a test, but makes a 70% on the test. Is this test, um, you know, the measurement of their knowledge, is it accurate, precise, or neither? It's not precise or accurate, all right? so. It's not precise because it's not very specific. It's just, you know, a 70%. Um, we, don't have we don't have consecutive measurements to see um, if it's consistent or not. And it doesn't have a decimal, so it could have been more precise. And then it's not accurate either. If the student really does know 85% of the material, they should make an 85% on the test. So it's not an accurate measurement of their knowledge. Another example. Ms. Joyner's dog, Millie, is known to weigh 65 pounds. Millie goes to the vet and is weighed three times at 71 pounds, 70.5, and 71.1 pounds. Are these measurements accurate, precise, or neither? Well, they're precise because they're consistent. All three measurements are pretty close to each other, but they're not accurate. If she is known, if the accepted value for her weight is 65 pounds, these experimental measurements are not close to that, so they are not correct. Often when we make measurements in labs to collect data, you will have to find an average. That's a skill that you're going to need to have and hopefully you've learned in math class. But just a little review, an average is where you add up all the values and divide by the total number of values. So for example, Callie measures her flower to be 30 centimeters tall. Jeff measures it to be 45 centimeters tall. Liam measures it to be 36 centimeters tall. Find the plant's average height. So we first add those up, 30 plus 45 plus 36. And then we would divide that total by 3. So that's 111 divided by 3. And we get 37 centimeters. All right, standard units. A standard is an exact quantity that people use for comparison. And since different people use different units all over the world, we had to choose some sort of standard so that we're all speaking the same language in terms of the data we're collecting. So the SI system was born. It's a system used by scientists around the world for making measurements so that we can compare them um, easily. Each type of measurement has a base unit typically and prefixes are used with these base units um, and are based on multiple ten, multiples of 10 and that'll make more sense a little bit later. So here are the units that I really want to highlight for you. First let's talk about measuring length. That's just measuring the distance between two points. The SI unit for length is meters, which is a little m. It's often measured using a meter stick or a ruler. Um, mass is the amount of matter in an object, and the SI unit for mass is kilogram or kg. We'd often find mass using a digital scale or a spring scale, like pictured here. 
Volume is the amount of space occupied by an object, and it's usually calculated with a geometric equation or with water displacement. So it actually doesn't have an SI unit, but the derived unit for it is a liter, which is abbreviated as a capital L. When we're measuring something like volume in a graduated cylinder, always measure to the bottom of the meniscus. That is the curve right here. So in this curve in the liquid, we would measure right there. It's sitting right on the 20. Um, time is the interval between two events, and the SI unit for time is seconds, which is abbreviated as a little s. And we would measure this using a stopwatch. All right. Temperature is the amount of heat in an object. Um, the SI unit is Kelvin, or, which is abbreviated as a capital K. The metric system, though, uses Celsius, which is degree C, and then the United States uses Fahrenheit, which is degrees Fahrenheit. It's often measured using a thermometer. We're going to learn more about... Uh, we're going to learn, excuse me, a more scientifically accurate definition of temperature in the future. Um, but for now, we're just going to leave it at that to keep it simple. Um, so one thing you need to be able to do is convert between Kelvin, Celsius, and Fahrenheit. And so we have a couple of equations that we're going to use in order to do that. So let's do an example. Mrs. Smith is going on vacation to Greece for her anniversary, and the weather is predicted to be 27 degrees Celsius. Mrs. Smith lives in the United States, though, and doesn't know what to pack for this weather. Help her to determine the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit so that she can pack. Okay, so what are we looking for? We're looking for degrees Fahrenheit. So this third equation is most appropriate because we want what we're looking for to be isolated and by itself. So we know that Celsius is 27. We don't know Fahrenheit. So again, we're going to use the equation where Fahrenheit is isolated. All right, now we're going to plug in. So for C, we're going to plug in 27 because C equals 27. Now, according to order of operations, we need to do parentheses first. So 27 times 9 fifths, or times 9 divided by 5, is 48.6. And then I'll add my 32, and you get 80.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So she needs to pack clothes. That would be good for warm weather. All right, so I want you to pause the video now and do these practice problems, and then press play and check your answers. Now in class, we are going to pause in practice temperature for the rest of class, but for the sake of this video, we're going to keep going on to conversions. So let's talk about those prefixes I mentioned earlier. These are used to avoid really large or really small numbers when we're collecting data. We attach them to a unit name. So we attach the prefix milli to the unit gram and get milligram, which is abbreviated as mg. These are some prefixes that I need you to know. Mega, kilo, hecto, deca, deci, centi, milli, micro, and nano. And this is kind of our middle ground here of a unit that they kind of go between. And so this is it's going to be meters for length, grams for mass, liters for volume, and seconds for time. So it tends to be your SI units, but not always, because again, liter is a derived unit, and then grams, the SI unit would be kilograms. So it's just when they're, I call them, I say it's just the last name. You know, you just got the family last name, and these prefixes are the first name. So just the last names are these units right here. All right, so I can convert between hectograms and centigrams, or megaseconds and just regular seconds. We can do that with these metric conversions. So here are your steps. Write down the given number and unit. Draw a picket fence that looks something like this. Use the chart to fill in appropriate conversion factors, which I will give to you, making sure matching units are on opposite sides of fence to cancel out. Multiply the top line across and the bottom line across, and then divide the top by the bottom. This makes a lot more sense when we actually do it. So let's do an example. How many meters are there in 48 kilometers? So first, we write our given number in unit, which would be 48 kilometers. Then we draw our picket fence. Then we are going to put in conversion factors with like units being opposite. So there are 1,000 meters in one kilometer. So I'll put 1,000 meters on top and one kilometer on the bottom so that the kilometers are opposite and they'll cancel out. This is basically my picket fence is almost just like a big multiplication of a bunch of fractions. Then I multiply across the top, which is 48 times 1,000, which is 48,000, and multiply across the bottom, which is just 1, 
and then I divide the top by the bottom. So 48,000 divided by 1, and we get 48,000 meters are in 48 kilometers. All right, let's try another. How many kilograms are there in 45,456 milligrams? All right, first write what you know with the given um, unit. So 45,456 milligrams. Step two, draw your picket fence. Step three, write in your conversion factor. So I don't have a direct conversion factor from milli to kilo, but I do know that there are 1,000 milligrams in one gram. And I'm putting my milligrams opposite so the units cancel out. I also know that there's 1,000 grams in one kilogram. So my milligrams cancel out this way and my grams cancel out this way, leaving me with only kilograms, which is what I'm looking for. Now I multiply across the top and across the bottom. 1,000 times 1,000 is 1 million. And then I divide the top by the bottom, and you get 0 0.045456 kilograms. All right, so pause the video and practice now. Now we're going to practice this a lot in class so you are a conversion pro.